Bob Cusack with The Hill, back with Mark Penn. And as we always do, Mark, let's, uh, let's have one word that summarizes your new polling data. Uh, the word is economics. Um, Why is that? Well, because when you look at the polling, so many people, right, about two-thirds are unhappy with the economy. Uh, almost half see their economic conditions as worsening. Uh, inflation is seen as the number one issue. They point to the high prices that they're paying in groceries. And you look at the political environment, and there's not that much discussion of of, of economics compared to cultural, social, criminal, uh, and, and other issues floating out there. And so I think the public's wondering, like, who is really going to address the problems? It's also something where Republicans and Trump have an advantage, but of course, Republicans and Trump talk about anything else but uh, economics. So, so it's so interesting. We know that that always has been a key determinant of our elections, but it doesn't really seem to be uh, top of mind. Uh, there is some attempt by the administration to improve its positioning with Bidenomics, but um, <clears throat> that looks like a tough road to hoe in this poll where people are so negative about the current economy that it's pretty hard to turn that around and say, oh, I should claim credit for how well it's going. It seems to me that instead they'd be working on how we're going to go from here. Yeah, now that was my next question because the White House, as you mentioned, they're they're embracing this and Bidenomics could be a great campaign slogan and strategy uh, in a year or it could be a punchline. Uh, right now, your data shows it's 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 trouble. I mean, people, even though there have been some indications, unemployment is low, inflation is going down. As you mentioned, inflation is still the top issue and then followed by the economy and jobs. And then you look at Biden's numbers. Now, in jobs, he's got a 47% approval rating. That's 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 pretty high for Biden. Uh, but on the economy, it's 38% approve, inflation 35%. And then you couple it with Trump uh, versus Biden in what right now is would be the matchup, certainly. And people prefer Trump's economic policies, uh, 56 to 44. How... How is Biden going to turn perception around? And can he win if he doesn't? Well, first, he can win because I, I don't know whether Trump's going to be the nominee or not. But obviously, if I were reading this poll, the only thing Trump should talk about is the economy. It's probably he throws it in as a sentence or two. Uh, but but that's not really kind of the, the real focus of where he or the Republicans are. Uh, these days, they're they're off on on way other issues, and Biden's trying a little bit of what we did in '96, where we said to people, "Hey, you know, the economy's <clears throat> not as bad as been portrayed." But but I think we had um, we had a solid basis uh, for doing that, and I knew that we could win the battle. Right now, you have to deal with the elephant in the room. That elephant is inflation, and a lot of people are feeling pinched by inflation. And you can't talk them out of those feelings. Uh, the one thing that you mentioned, Bob, is, well, I don't know what the economy is going to be a year from now. If uh, Fed does a good job, inflation comes down, uh, people could be feeling really good. This could be could evaporate as an issue. And let's go to the Trump side, because, as you know, Mark, both parties have major problems uh, and, and your polling data reflects it. Um, 57 percent. And and as we're talking, uh, we expect a, a third indictment against Trump on January 6th, uh, coming down the pike any any moment. 57 um, percent think there's a strong case a, against Trump, uh, even though most think he'll be acquitted. But what did the data show about this indictment that's different than the than the first two or expected indictment being the third one? Well, I think we know as we went back on the politics, the first indictment in New York was just a fundraising opportunity for Trump. He bounced up. Uh, the second indictment really didn't make much difference. He stayed in the same position. Uh, I think this polling shows that people are more likely to take this indictment seriously, that most people think the prosecutor has a good case. A lot of people think that he went beyond uh, what free speech allows. I think a, a really solid indictment 
with a lot of you know information about what he really did do on January 6th is negative, could really uh, could really push back Trump. I think this could make a difference uh, <clears throat> more so than I think these other indictments did. I think I think January 6th is an event that everybody knows about. Uh, it is more front and center. What happened in New York with Stormy Daniels is hardly something people think uh, really merited an indictment. And these classified documents, people's attitude is more, well, every, every one of these people had classified documents that they mishandled from Hillary on. Uh, but I think January 6th is uniquely, you can't blame a Democrat for January 6th. Well, let's, now let's talk about a couple of investigations the White House doesn't want to talk about. Uh Number one on the the Hunter Biden uh, issue and the whistleblowers, and we saw testimony uh, from the whistleblowers, public testimony. Sixty one percent, you know, b- believe this is this is something that 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 merits attention, and also sixty three percent want more investigation of the cocaine found in the White House. Are these issues? Uh, they're not the economy. They're not inflation. Um, but do you think this could hamper? Uh, Biden's uh, bid for a second term. Well, look, I don't. I don't think the cocaine investigation or not will hamper his bid for a second term. I was curious that we rarely see criminal investigations ended in a short period of time, and I think that the, that ending it as opposed to kicking the can down the road certainly aroused some some suspicions of the voters who think that well, this should be investigated more. But I don't think that's going to be. Uh, a, a major issue here or there. I do think, though, that when it comes to the whistleblowers, it's interesting. It wasn't just Republicans who heard about them. It was across the board about 45%. A lot of people haven't heard about them yet, a majority. That means as, as this information gets known, it, it could be more damaging. And second, their credibility was seen across the three parties. Almost everything that we poll related to these indictments and things is Democrats one way, Republicans the other. <clears throat> I, I think this this has, again, uh, potential for real damage here, uh, depending upon the, the next sets of information that come out, uh, what the whistleblowers have to say. Um, I think I think that uh, both January 6th and this are, are, are big issues for the, the, the people who are most lined up to be the next candidates. One of the most striking things uh, from your from your polling data is the approval rating of RFK Jr. Forty seven percent approve, twenty six percent disapprove. As you know, Mark, he said some very controversial things on vaccines and other other issues. What do you make of that? Well, there are two possibilities in terms of RFK Jr.'s favorability. Uh, one is that it's the family name. Most people don't know that there's another uh, RFK Jr. running around, and the family name and halo is kind of providing that. The, the second is people kind of like him as an outside bomb thrower. Maybe some of his conspiracy theories are crazy. Some of them are right. Um, and they're, they're into it. I mean, Elon Musk does pretty well with the public as well. Um I, I think that uh, we don't really know. I mean, when you look at the Democratic primary, I don't see him at his, I think, 16 uh, percent as a real threat to Biden. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if Democrats uh, really, really kind of take a strategy of being super aggressive against him, as I think they did at the at the hearing, that that doesn't make much sense. Uh, it would make more sense for let him have his say and and kind of move on to another day. And I think the Democrats kind of can create a boomerang uh, being, you know, treating him the way that they're, they seem to embark in terms of treating and, 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 and really turn this into a big controversy when it didn't have to be. I think that Biden right. could fail in here. Um, another thing is another popular uh, now politician, I guess, but, but also Part of the reason his numbers, I think, are so high is he's an outsider. Is Vivek Ramaswamy, thirty-four percent approval rating, uh, approve of him. Now a lot of people still don't know who he is. Eighteen disapprove, but that is in positive territory. And DeSantis is really struggling in your polls. Vivek is making ground up against DeSantis with not if it's not uh, uh, if Trump is taken out of the race, 
uh, DeSantis. Vivac is behind DeSantis, but he's catching up fast. And in your poll with Trump in it, uh, he's right behind him now in double digits. Uh, why is why is he rising? Well, I, I think that he's he's a straight shooter. He's he's hitting issues, innovative ideas, putting partisanship aside more so than anybody else. says. Look, I'm a smart guy. I'm going to work hard. I got some creative ideas. Take a look. I could make a good president. You know, you're kind of tired of your typical, you know, either politician or someone who's mired in fights and arguments and politics of negativity. You know, and and obviously Ron DeSantis is in the Jeb Bush seat, the Florida governor who looks so great in the beginning. Uh, look, we all thought Joe Biden was not going to be the nominee last time. <laughs> we all thought that he was down and out, uh, you know, coming into South Carolina. And then all of a sudden he was the nominee. So <laughs> so I know people love this parlor game. It is factually correct that Vivek has come from nowhere, is beginning to get more recognition uh, has is beginning to get a real constituency, and the other candidates so far, DeSantis has come, you know, kind of set back. Scott has a small constituency, a favorable image, uh, hasn't yet really gotten to the point where where he can get traction. I mean, uh, and I think Trump, you know, I think Trump is overrated to some extent. He's not polling in the 60s the, the way that uh, the Biden is polling in the Democratic Party. And the fact that there are so many other candidates against him also is somewhat illusory. So we'll we'll see. I think uh, I think there's more openness in the Republican Party than it looks. And I'm, I'm not I, I think I, I wrote a column, I think, about a month ago that uh, that if DeSantis hoped to have a uh, an opportunity here. He should he should get off all the cultural issues and get on a lot of the economic issues. And uh, that, of course, is not what he did. <laughs> well, we have the first uh, Republican presidential primary debate coming up next month. Um, and uh, when you think back to 2015, uh, it got huge ratings, the first debate. We don't know if Trump is going to show up. Um, but how important is that debate going to be for Ron DeSantis. I agree. It's very early. I don't think uh, you can write off anybody at this when they haven't even interacted with one another, but is, he's going to have to show something there, right? Well, as you recall, Michael Bloomberg made it through one debate last time. Yes. <laughs> so there are one debate wonders uh, and Ron DeSantis could be the next one. So uh, his debate prep has got to be pretty intense. I think it's going to be an important event. I think it might be better if Trump doesn't go. Um, because I think people want to look at the Trump alternatives. It, it could be then the, the, a debate on who's the best alternative. Chris Christie is going to say, look, I'm the best, uh, you know, alternative. I could be the toughest. I could be the strongest. Tim Scott's going to say, I have a, you know, positive approach here to moving the country forward and I can bring the country together. Vivix uh, is going to say that I've got some new ideas here. Uh, and Ron DeSantis is going to have to say, hey, I've got a record. I can handle these problems. I've proven that I could take counterintuitive positions and stand up. Uh, and and I don't know. Or he's going to go into a lot of go woke, go broke, which I don't think gets him a lot. Uh, you also uh, pulled people on AI, which is getting a lot of attention. There's a lot of excitement around AI, but there's also a lot of concern, basically almost three and four. I think uh, AI is dangerous. Uh, what was your takeaway? Uh, my takeaway is a lot of people are interested in it. 28% have already tried it uh, in our poll. Uh, most people see this as a the dawn of a new technological revolution that could really impact people's lives. Uh, there's a lot of fear about loss of jobs. Uh, I think that in particular, um, for most new technologies, People really have seen overwhelmingly the promise of those technologies. The internet was seen as, as kind of a new, you know, bringing everyone together and connecting them up. And you know, the iPhone was seen, and smartphones in general were seen as, as kind of changing life for a positive way, where we could all stay, uh, stay connected and get information anywhere. Uh, this is the first new technology I've seen where the fear is up front. Hmm. Usually the fears come in like social media. Oh, this is cool. This is interesting. And oh, wow, what's it doing to our kids? That doesn't develop for 10 years. People realize that AI can be dangerous. 
could be used to create fakes that can't be perceived, could create massive fraud, could create massive misinformation, confusion, uh, could be threatening you know, militarily. Uh, at the same time, they think it could revolutionize their jobs, change life, uh, change a lot of aspects of life. In life, can help create robots that that we can really talk to and and, and have do things on a on a conversational level. So I think that the the public is right. I think that that this has great both promise, great promise, and uh, and also uh, if out of control, uh, could have a you know catastrophic results. Uh, then maybe you're going to ask me a follow up on who should regulate it, but. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, who should? Uh, should it be Congress or the administration or both? Well, the interesting thing is public said, I want regulation, uh, but then they didn't really want the government doing the regulation because the fear is if the government regulates AI, that means the government is going to regulate it in a way that gets AI working on behalf of the government. And that's even worse, right? <laughs> um, so they're really looking to the industry to set standards of ethics uh, and regulate itself which is also kind of very unlikely to happen uh, in the growth of new technology. So I don't know how you how you kind of tame this in a way that the public will have confidence in because of the problem that, that there's just as much fear that the government will use AI regulation for its own ends. Mm-hmm. Uh, any any closing thoughts? And one last question I did want to ask you is just you know, we're not going to have a podcast in, in August, uh, but but also talk about the timing because post Labor Day, that's when it gets really serious as far as the political season. Well, I think then that in terms of politics, like we're going to have the first debate August 23rd. Then a lot of people get together with their families over Labor Day weekend. I have always found that the Labor Day kitchen table conversations then produce kind of the fall political outlook. And so to me, the most important poll has always been what are what do people talk about on Labor Day, and then when they weren't playing pickleball, and uh, and what is it that they really kind of begin to think, and they begin to think kind of more seriously uh, about this political season. And we're going to have some intervening events, maybe, maybe this January sixth, maybe more progress in the Hunter Biden investigations. Uh, I, I don't think this political season is over. I think this political season is just beginning, and I, I think that uh, our, our next poll will be the, the starting gun that, uh, that sets off that season. Yes, especially post-Republican uh, debate. That will be interesting to see what the data uh, show. Mark Penn, thanks so much. Thanks, Bob.